Marxism and Freedom by Rhea Dunayevskaya, Chapter 16, Automation and the New Humanism. The American Scene. America is not exempt from the development of state capitalism, the supreme development of which we have, de we have been describing in our analysis of the Russian economy. What World War II showed as the role of the state in the economy was not a war phenomenon. The foundations for it were laid in the previous period as can graphically be seen from a study in the temporary National Economic Committee reports. The true index of the present stage of capitalism is the role of the state in the economy. A war or peace, the state does not diminish monopolies and trusts nor does it diminish its own interference. Rather, it develops hothouse fashion, that characteristic mode of behavior of capitalism, centralization of capital on the one hand and socialization of labor on the other. The planners form to one side, the workers to the other. The workers build their own organizations like the CIO as against the NRA or take to wildcatting as against the labor bureaucracy. State capitalism is not a continuous development of capitalism in the sense of a development without breaks. It is a development through transformation into opposite. Capitalism lived and progressed by free competition. Hence, it found its fullest development under a democratic bourgeois or parliamentary democracy. State capitalism means and can only mean bureaucracy, tyranny and barbarism, as could have been seen in Nazi Germany and can be seen in totalitarian Russia. One would have to be blind not to see the elements of it everywhere, including the United States. Intrinsically, Marx wrote, it is not a question of the higher or lower degree of development of the social antagonisms that result from the natural laws of capitalist production. It is a question of these laws themselves of these tendencies working with iron necessity towards inevitable results. The country that is more developed only shows to the less developed the image of its own future. The same we must add is true in reverse. Given the context of the world market and the accelerated development of a backward country, once it begins catching up with the advanced country, the former shows the latter the image of its own future. The Hitlers, the Mussolinis, the Stalins are not Germans, Italians and Russians only, nor are their wills theirs alone. They represent objective forces. Stalin thought he was fashioning the state in the image of the party. Consciously, that is what he was doing. Objectively, however, the exact opposite was true. The state transformed the party in its image, which, in turn, was but a reflection of the production process of capitalism at its ultimate stage of development. The distinguishing feature of state monopoly as against private monopoly is its abolition of any difference between politics, the state and production, the economy. The party is the executor of the state plan and society as the hierarchy of plant managers foremen, as well as trade union representatives, execute it at the point of production. Marx knew whereof he spoke when he said that the whole of the capitalistic economy could be summed up in one phrase. Domination of dead over living labor. By now, the barrack-like discipline with which this domination is exercised has assumed, even in, in its living visage, a death-like mask. Terror and death are the middle names of the ruling class, which calls itself the classless intelligentsia. Once we already have at hand an actual existing fully developed single state capitalist society, there is no point, however, in tracing through the economic development where state capitalism is only a tendency. Although America is headed in the same direction as Russia, Russia and America are by no means identical twins. There is something very American about the development of the scientific individual who labors under the illusion that he can avoid the totalitarian consequences of state capitalism. 
witnessed the experiments and studies on the question of human relations in industry, which mushroomed during the 1930s, and again after World War II, at the very same time as we underwent the great transformation of New Deal planning and approached the age of automation. For the purposes, therefore, of tracing a difference, the scientific individual with and against the state administrator, there is no more perfect country to watch than America, which is so barren of theoreticians that it is under the illusion that it has escaped Marxism. The great divide in everyone's thinking is, of course, the Depression. The Depression had destroyed once and for all the workers' belief in the rationality of the economic system. Where there was employment, it soon became clear that no more could be squeezed out of the workers on the basis of the old economic relations. Where there was unemployment, and that was everywhere by the millions, the chaos of capitalism was all too obvious. The most famous of the human relations studies was the Hawthorne Project, undertaken by the Western Electric Company under the scientific supervision of Elton Mayo, professor of these professor of industrial research at Harvard University. What was new in all these studies was what was that the analysts began with human relations in industry as the basic problem of our day. Concerned thus, they made a, special, a specialty of plant interviews and on the spot reporting. Elton Mayo was the first of these scientific intellectuals to discover the production code by which production workers conduct themselves. One, don't be a rate buster by turning out too much work. Two, don't be a chiseler by, by turning out too little work. Three, don't be a squealer by gossiping or complaining to a supervisor about a fellow worker. Four, don't act like a big shot or put on airs. By the 1940s, it became quite clear that the American workers were developing a new economic philosophy to replace the capitalistic one that Marx called production for production's sake. It was not too hard to sense that the XGIs, far from separating themselves from the workers, were in the forefront of this destru destruction of the old economic philosophy. Many others, writes Sebastian de Grazia in the political community, have documented the imperson impersonalism of the modern scene with specialized studies of the rooming house dweller, the hotel guest, or the marginal man. More or less, they have kept without the bounds of bias. For this reason, one must turn to another source, the modern worker himself, to find protest against the competitive directive, protest unembellished with symbolism and unrestrained by fear of making moral judgments. Hell, supposing I do get a better job, it will be a nickel an hour more, that's all. That's right, there's no sense in being pushed around by foreman if you don't have to. Mine is a Simon Legree. He jumped a guy the other day for talking too long, or taking too long to go out to the can. My God, it's drive, drive all day long, no visiting at the bench, no nothing. The son of a bitch across the street is one good reason why a lot of men are leaving that plant. Him and a lot like him. He is a foreman. He started a friend of mine running two milling machines instead of one. Jesus. Naturally, Jack says no. So the foreman calls the superintendent. The superintendent says that the matter, what's the matter with you GIs? Are you afraid to work? Jack tells him, no, I'm not afraid to work, but that's just too much. You know what you can do with your job. The bosses are just laying it on too thick. They expect too much. There are a couple of bad foremen at the plant where I work. Just a couple of days ago, a GI went out to the can and my foreman tells him he stayed too long. He said the war is over now. Can you imagine that? In another department, a GI made a mistake or didn't get his work done fast enough or something. And the foreman says, where have you been? So the guy cracks back in Italy taking care of you. That story did my heart good. Sure, I think most of us would admit we could double our take home if we wanted to shoot the works, but where's the percentage? A guy has to get something out of life. 
Now my little lady would rather have me in a good humor than have the extra money. The way it works out, none of us are going to be Van Asterbilds. So why not get a little pleasure out of living together and working together? This is the fact from which all contemporary sociology and social psychology begins. The rejection by the workers of all the old capitalist controls and standards. Oh, hold on. I feel like I missed something. No, I didn't. One, rank and file versus labor leaders. If World War II succeeded, as it did, in helping to transform the American labor leadership, hothouse fashion into a labor bureaucracy, and to disclose Ruther as the planner who outplanned GM's Wilson with blueprints to transform auto plants into bomber plants, the workers were even faster in learning to hate the labor bureaucracy on a par with management. Since the end of World War II and continuing to this day, a Detroit production worker writes, the company has made changes in the shop with the help of the workers' representatives, the stewards, committee men, and union officers. After the UAW, the steward, uh, hold on, after, after the UAW was organized, one of the worst crimes a union representative could commit was to be friendly to a foreman. I have known stewards to lose their position for being friendly with a foreman. There was a clear and decisive line drawn between the workers and the company. Any worker would have a tough time if he or she talked or kidded around with the foreman. They would be labeled a company stooge. In those early days, if a worker had an argument with the foreman, the foreman would try his best to settle it. The foreman never wanted the worker to call the steward. He knew the steward would defend the worker. The workers used their strength against the company even if it meant going out on strike. The union leaders were forced to go along with them. They depended on the strength of the workers. The feeling of solidarity was close and felt by the average worker. In the past five or six years, there has been agitation by the union officials that the company is not too bad and that the workers who cause strikes want to starve the other workers and their families. Labor and management, say the leaders, can live peacefully side by side. The labor leaders threaten workers who cause strikes. Hundreds of workers have been fired by the company for taking strike action with the approval of the union. The other workers have been frightened by what they have, what they have seen happen. This has also tended to weaken the close relations the workers had toward each other. Today, the steward spends practically all of his time in the office of supervision or walking around with his arm around company officials. They have hardly any time to talk to the workers unless it is election time. They agree with the company on most of the differences between the workers and management. When a worker has a difference with the foreman today, the foreman will say, call the committee men. He knows how they will act. In many instances, the foreman will go get the steward. He uses these against the workers. Not so long ago in my plant, the company took a worker off an operation where there were three workers doing the same type of operation. These workers put up a howl. The superintendent came up and said, if you don't do it, I will call the committeeman and you will have to do it anyway. In this same period, this is how one committeeman described how workers keep not only the big bureaucrats, but even the committeeman isolated. The burning problems in the shops today are centered not around wages so much as around the bitter hostility of the workers to their role in production. In building their unions, they, fought, they thought that they were creating instruments of organizing and controlling production in their own interest. The capitalists, aware of this, insisted that the unions recognize the capitalist mode of production. This is the basic conflict that the labor leadership is unable to resolve. This is the dilemma that destroys innumerable leaders who have risen out of the working class. This conflict arises constantly in many different forms. It plagues the union leaders on the local level constantly. For example, a production standard is established. The man assigned to the job refuses to perform according to standards. 
He is sent to labor relations where he is disciplined in order to produce as required. The committeeman who is there to represent the man can only chime in and tell the worker that on the basis of the contract, he must produce according to production standards or face discharge. Another example, production is set for a whole line of say 200 men. The men protest the production that is set and are ready to strike. Either the company or the men call the committeeman. He tells the men that the company has the right to set the production, that it is illegal to strike, and that the men should accept the standard. The higher levels of the leadership try to solve this dilemma by fighting for concessions outside the process of production. They give the impression of social workers in and out of the plant. The workers are aware of this. One day, a worker was protecting a speed up and said to me, what are you going to do about it? I know nothing is usual. What good is the union? Now don't tell me about the local's grocery store or about being able to get women's clothes cheaper. Do something about the speed up. The problem everywhere, production wise, as well as politically, has become a battle to increase productivity. Labor leaders, engineers, businessmen, educators, and government officials collaborate in conferences on productivity that parallel the Russian production conferences. But not much seemed to have resulted from them until one day it became clear that while philosophically these conferences led nowhere, the working together of pure science and practical engineering did produce a miracle. When a Ford executive coined a word for this miracle, automation, the word took wing. Automation has cut across the thinking of the people more sharply than anything else since the Industrial Revolution nearly 200 years ago. At the point of production, automation has compelled two fundamentally different class attitudes, depending on which side of the machine you stand. If you are the one who operates it, you feel its impact in every hone of your body. You are more sweaty, more tired, more tense, and you feel about as useful as a fifth wheel. You are never on top of the machine. The machine is always on top of you and keeps you isolated from your fellow workers. In addition, you feel more isolated as more and more of your shopmates are displaced by the monster machine. If, on the other hand, you are the one who drives the men and counts the production for management, you praise the machine you praise the machine to the skies. This attitude of the capitalists and their agents has acted as a brainwashing of the labor bureaucracy. Instead of listening to the specific grievances and aspirations of the workers, instead of listening to their complaints against the conditions of labor and new speed ups, instead of listening when the workers question the very kind of labor that would transform man into a cog of machine and make the machine into the thinker, the labor, the labor bureaucracy counseled the workers to do nothing against automation. Thus, when the miners were first confronted with the continuous miner in 1949, John L. Lewis disregarded their general strike and announced instead that the union, union was for progress. The working force in the mines was literally cut in half. When automation reached Ford, Ruther told the auto workers to consider the future which would bring them a six hour day and not to fight against the present unemployment. Meanwhile, there has been no change in the working day since the workers, through their own struggles over decades, won the eight hour day. There is not a college from the University of Michigan to Harvard that does not have its technology project. The labor bureaucracy appears at the conference to parrot the words of the educated. The actual findings of care studies are hidden behind the windy words of labor, labor bureaucrat and professor. Take the case that every Detroit auto worker knows only too well, the closing down of the Murray Body Works several years ago. 5,000 workers found themselves with lots of time on their hands and no money in their pockets. They were out of work. The management, however, was forward-looking. They went into another business, bowling alleys. 
they moved out of Detroit. The 5,000 auto workers remained in, in Detroit and remained unemployed. Or take the cases of those who remain on the job in automated plants. Contrary to the ease that push-button work was supposed to bring about, the workers all say, the more production, the more speed and tension. Contrary to Ruther's abstractions of every worker and engineer, there is little or no upgrading with automation. While the brainwashing of the labor leadership finds no need of any torture chambers, they are all too deaf to the concrete demands of the workers and all too willing victims of abstractions, which help to maintain capitalist exploitation. Yet precisely in the workers' attitudes to automation can be discerned the pathway to totally new relations at the point of production, and therefore in society. Automation and the New Humanism Technology discloses man's mode of dealing with nature, the process of production by which he sustains his life and thereby lays bare the mode of formation of his social relations and of the mental conceptions that flow from them. Every history of religion, even that fails to take account of the material basis, is uncritical. The weak points in the abstract materialism of natural science are that it excludes history and its process. This was a quote from Marx. One, different attitudes to automation. 1950 opened a new era in production. That was the year of the first serious introduction of automation in the form of the continuous minor. The word automation had not yet gained its present currency <clears throat> the fact of automation, however, brought about the longest strike in the mine workers' history since the creation of the CIO. The strike broke out to the most modern of the, of the mines, those where the largest coal corporation, Console, had introduced the continuous miner. During this nine months old strike, the miners turned against John L. Lewis another first since the creation of the CIO. Nor did the Taft-Hartley law, which fined their union $1 million, stop them. The miners were determined that no one would do their thinking for them. They kept their thoughts to themselves, but they showed their concern was not with the union treasury, nor solely with the threat of unemployment. They were concerned with something new, something they called a man-killer, the continuous miner. The automatic miner was man oh hold on. The automatic miner was frightening in an entirely new way. The miners were concerned not just with the old grievances and hazards. This automation was recognized as a man killer in a total way. Soon it proved itself to be the horror the miners feared. The ceaseless the ceaselessness of its operation, the drive were such that by today, men with seniority are trying to use their seniority to stay off of it and are saying they'd rather be laid off than have to work on it. Back in 1949, it was, it was not yet true. Unemployment in the coal region was at its greatest since the depression. The continuous miner was creating ghost towns everywhere in Pennsylvania and West Virginia. The miners were literally starving because of their long strike, yet they refused to obey the order to return to work. That was the first serious break between the miners and John L. Lewis in nearly two decades. One miner told this writer, There is a time for praying. We do that on Sundays. There is a time for acting. We took matters in our hands during the Depression, building up our union and seeing that our families did not starve. There is a time for thinking. The time is now. What I want to know is how and wh when will the working man, all working men, have such confidence in their own abilities to make a better world that will not let others do their thinking for them? The miner felt that the union wasn't much better than the company nowadays. The reason for this is that the rank and file had let others, the leadership, do their thinking and write their contracts for them. What was the point of talking about progress when the new machine was making a havoc of your life, both on the job 
and off of it. This miner pointed out that the change the worker had brought through, this, through his activity has somehow turned into its opposite. The miners would elect someone to represent them in, in negotiations with management. Then the first thing anyone knew was that their representative became a labor bureaucrat who turned up in the district office. Not to fight with the workers against the company, but to the order the workers to produce more. This miner wanted to know what made the miners stick together in 1943 and tell the senators that if they were so interested in production, they could dig the coal themselves. Yet no one tells the same thing to the Libra leadership today. The working man has a mind of his own, concluded the miner. So why let others do his thinking for him? If only there was no division between thinking and doing. But no one heard the voice of the miner. No one listened. The daily papers were full of the fine Judge Goldsboro imposed on Lewis and so was the United Mine Workers Union paper. As for the radical papers, they were reporting yet one more strike and once again, expressing their sympathy. By 1953, recession hit the United States and in Detroit, the auto capital of the world, unemployment assumed such mass proportions that the word automation took wing. Automation is not a single machine designed for any particular industry. It is rather a method of doing things through a series of machines or mechanisms that replace men in the process of production. It results in a completely automatic or semi-automatic process of production where the worker is reduced to watching the machine and to pushing buttons. While another group of men stand by to repair the machine as it breaks down. Everyone now, from scientists who had originally predicted the most dire results from this new industrial revolution, to the Ford executive who coined the word, to the bus businessmen's weeklies, began to blame the word automation for bringing back depression jitters. Business Week went on as, went as far as to say the, that automation was 90% emotion and only 10% fact. The labor, labor bureaucrats assisted by bowing before progress and painting the future as it should be instead of speaking of what is. The sharp division between the rank and file worker and the labor bureaucrat is seen nowhere so clearly as in the different attitudes each has toward automation. Where the auto worker, for example, deals with it as it affects his daily life, Ruther speaks of the future and the promise automation holds for a, for a vast improvement in living conditions and leisure. I do not know what he is talking about, one woman worker told this writer. I don't have any time to breathe, much less to, to loll about. The work week at Ford's now is 53 hours, and here that man goes around talking about leisure. As for working conditions, they are worse than they have ever been since the CIO first came into being. All automation has meant to us is unemployment and overwork, both at the same time. One miner told this writer that he lost 30 pounds in weight caused by the speed up and tensions of automatic production. He added that was only half of the story. The other half was safety. They just don't take out the time anymore for the right underpinnings and there has been a serious rise in accidents. It's just not safe, he said. I'm not working under protest. I'm just not doing it. What good will working under protest do me? What good will working under protest do me if I get killed? The company isn't going to take care of my wife and kids if something happens to me. We already had one man killed because the company tried this before. I know that I'm not going to be the next one. In Auto 2, workers now point to automation as a safety hazard. One Detroit story re read, worker after worker says, there's something about these machines that's going to mess up a lot of people. One man said, 
We weren't on the job a day when a man lost his finger and had the one next to it crushed. Before the week was out, another man lost a finger and a third man had three fingers chopped off by the machine. There are signs all over the shop saying, are you doing it safely? Inside half an hour after the man was hurt, the workers had written under all these signs, this machine is not safe enough to do it with. Far from automation bringing new jobs, there has been a disastrous cut in, in employed miners from 425,000 in 1948 to 225,000 in 1955, or as much as in the whole half century previous to that. The new jobs going to the young maintenance men is meant to divide up the production workers from the skilled new scientific men. But thus far, the company has not succeeded in doing that. John L. Lewis, who has always stood for progress and technology, got them more wages in which the workers were not interested instead of getting a shorter work week and better conditions, which the miners want. <clears throat> By 1955, the long Westinghouse strike finally forced everyone to admit that it was an automation strike. They called it the first automation strike and the crucial struggle was finally recognized to be that of time steady. The electrical workers knew that the study of each motion of their hands was not to lighten their toil, but to incorporate the motion in a machine which would take away the job of a hundred, a hundred and multiply by tenfold the speed of those left to operate the monster machine. The workers don't go in for abstract argumentation on leisure and plenty at some future, unspecified time. They ask concrete questions now. One, how much unemployment will automation bring about? Two, does the seniority for which he fought so hard and which protected the worker against the arbitrariness of the company's firing mean nothing under the new conditions? Three, what about the ceaseless speed up? These machines are man killers that are constantly breaking down and breaking down the nervous system of the men themselves. Whereas a, a Detroit radio poll showed that, next to Russia, what the workers feared most was automation, the United States Department of Labor busily sought to reassure us about automation, because it will not come like a tidal wave, but rather like ground swells hitting different industries at different times. The old radicals pontif pontificated that, of course, you fight alongside workers for immediate demands, but actually capitalism can never fully institute automation because there are too many vested interests in the capital structure as it now stands. There is no doubt that only about one tenth of the investment that autom automatic controls could use has been invested because of the complicating features involved, both as to pull of labor and obsolescence of material. As Marx long ago put it, the final barrier to capitalism is capital itself. The tendency to stagnation and decay as the tendency to the decline in the rate of profit is inherent in capitalism. We see today concretely what Marx wrote of theoretically, that capitalist society must, under penalty of death, transform the worker from a fragment of a man, a living appendage to a machine, into one who is fully developed and fit for a variety of labors. Nevertheless, there is nothing automatic either about the collapse of capitalism or the inevitable emergence of a new society. Quite the contrary. There is no solution other than letting the historical antagonisms work themselves out. The capitalist will give nothing of his free will while the worker is being united, disciplined, and organized by the very mechanism of production to revolt against being a cog in a machine. The scientists finally admit that automation has made everyone jumpy. Dr. Charles R. Walker, Director of Technology and Industrial Research at Yale, reports that studies 
are even being conducted by medical doctors on the harmful effects of tra tranquilizers, or as the workers call them, nerve pills, which have, which have become so widespread. Yet all he can come up with when he views the future is, what can we find as substitutes for time? Contrast this intellectual attitude to that of the miner who said that only a new unity of theory and practice, unified in the worker himself, would assure the creation of a really new society. The question was, when would the worker gain confidence in his own abilities to stop letting others do his thinking for him? The labor bureaucracy being committed to this progress offers no way for the workers to express themselves except through wildcats. There were 170 such strikes in the coal fields just from January through April of 1956. Of these strikes, the one to which Lewis gave the most attention at the 42nd Annual Miners Convention was the massive wildcat which paralyzed the entire coal industry in North northern West Virginia during the late spring of 1956. It involved the men of District 31. Lewis branded that mass eruption of miners as the work of some individuals ambitious in character, hoping perhaps they would be called upon and elected to some high office. Apparently, the head of the United Mine Workers Union thinks it a shame that the miners fought to protect their lives instead of letting the company get away with having one man on a machine. Lewis wound up his blast against the miners in District 31 with this warning. Carry the message back, he said. Don't do it again. You will be fully conscious that I am breathing down your necks. Everyone now knows that full production does not mean full employment. The Bureau of Labor Statistics shows that while national production in 1955 was up 11% over 1954, employment was up only 1%. Those who suffer most are the production workers. For example, in the chemical industry, production went up 53% in the eight years after World War II. While the number of production workers rose only 1.3%, from 525,000 to 532,000. At the same time, the number of non-production workers, engineers, office workers, etc., rose more than 70%, from 169,000 to 259,000. Despite the increase in skilled workers, this marked a gain of only 14% in total employment contrasted with a 53% output or gain in a 53% gain in product output in the 8 year period ending in 1955 the 87% or fuck the output of goods in the electrical manufacturing industry soared 87% but the number of salaried employees ro rose only 20% production workers increased only 16% Not only in pockets of depression, like the textile industry in New England and the South, but in auto, producing at full speed, unemployment is a steady feature. Indeed, since the end of World War II, despite the great rise in production, employment in manufacturing has slowed down to a crawl. For the time being, the armed forces and the service trades have absorbed many of the unemployed, but by no means at all but by no means all, nor will they. Those who try to fool themselves, they are certainly not fooling the production workers. That expansion of service trades contains the answer should remember that anything that is not produced needs no servicing. Finally, for the youth, factory work has no interest whatever. A young worker I met in Los Angeles said, what skill do you need in this day of automation? What pride can you have in your work if everything is done electronically and you are there? If you are lucky to get the job just to blow the whistle when the machine breaks down, what about the human being? The todayness of Marx is truly overwhelming. His description of the automaton 90 years ago fits more precisely the description of automation than that of any present day writers. 
in opposition to the liberals of his day who saw increased production as meaning the happy life of abundance, Marx described the concrete strife of worker and machine when it is capitalistically controlled. An organized system of machines to which motion is communicated by the transmitting mechanism from a central automaton is the most developed form of production by machinery. The lightening of the labor even becomes a sort of torture since the machine does not free the laborer from work, but deprives the work of all interest. By means of its conversion into an automaton, the instrument of labor confronts the laborer during the labor process in the shape of capital or dead labor that dominates and pumps dry living labor power. The separation of intellectual power of production from manual labor and the conversion of those powers into the might of capital over labor is finally completed by modern industry erected on the foundation of machinery. Because all science, all knowledge is today embodied in the machine, the role of the intellectual has changed from the sphere of culture to that of production. If in the 1930s our academicians discovered the production code and in the 1940s the production philosophy, Automation in the 1950s has confronted them with such power that they simply, to use a Hegelian phrase, perished. Thus, what was only an intimation 100 years ago is concretely embodied today in the class role of the planner. As against the authoritarian plan that arose out of capitalistic production to discipline the worker. As against the autom automaton as the motive force of production. Marx pointed to the human aspect not in order to adjust it to the status quo, but to disclose a new society in which labor is not alienated, but is itself the first necessity of living. 2. Workers think their own thoughts. Hegel, the exponent of the dialectic, was incapable of understanding dialect dialectically the transition from matter to movement, from matter to consciousness, especially the second. Marx corrected the mistake or weakness of the mystic. That was a quote from Lenin. What is new in automation is the maturity of our age in which the totality of the crisis compels philosophy, compels a total outlook. The struggle for the minds of men when the tendency toward complete mechanization has reached its most acute point in automation cannot be won in any other way. The new, the new impulse comes and can come only from the workers. Contrast to the chimera of the scientist who writes of man viewed as machine, the sanity of the production workers who writes that work will have to be something totally different. When the women at work talked about someday they were going to do the wiring automatically, I didn't really understand the word automation. I responded to what my friend said. What would happen to us? She said they would probably have to give us jobs on the machines. It was all very hazy though. Now the word is all over the place and it holds both fascination and fear. I saw on TV an automated auto engine factory. They made one engine in 15 minutes where it used to take nine hours. The magazine Saturday Review had a special issue on automation. It had seven or eight different writers, some from business and one from the UAW CIO. What gets me is how the clearest one was the industrialist. The others seemed scared to say much about what it will do to people. He doesn't care. He just says exactly what he thinks. There is one little paragraph of his I can't get out of my mind. Another highly desirable feature of automation in relation to labor is the fact that machines are easier to control than people, and this is a blessing in our democratic society. I can't tell exactly what I get from it. It's like this is it, the point of no return. He doesn't give a darn what happens to these people he talks about, and maybe I don't really understand, but I think he would like to do away with one thing in this society, and that is democracy. There is something else, more time. You know, that scares me more than anything else. If I get more leisure time under this society, I think I would go crazy. This is very silly because I've always wanted the shorter work day. They don't bother much about what happens to people, not just people, but the unskilled worker. They are a little scared. Not scared of what happens to the workers, but I think scared of what the workers will do to them. 
I can't help thinking over and over that this is it. They have thrown so many workers into the streets with their old production methods and now automation. Even if the union gets the shorter week and annual wage, what happens to all the workers all over the country that are not working now? There are some things about automation that are terrific, but the capitalists and the unions can't do any good with them. We say man is able to work, to produce, to work with alongside other workers. This is life to him. Now what happens under automation? I don't see man working. Do the energies go towards something else? But what? This and the leisure time is connected somewhere, though I don't exactly know where. Man likes to work, to build something, but today work is so separate from everything else in your life. Each day is divided. You work, then you have some time in which to rest. Forget about work, escape from it. What will be, what will be with automation? There is less work for man, as I think of work today, but there is more time. I am scared of more time the way things are now, because more time for the worker might be seven days a week with no paycheck at the end of the week. I used to be told that the fight for more leisure time was so that the individual could have more time for art, music, literature, for study in general. That doesn't satisfy me any longer. Under a new society, work will have to be something completely new, not just work to get money to buy food and things. It will have to be completely tied up with life. Just as from the first industrial revolution, the workers in the factory gained the impulse for the struggles for the shortening of the working day and thus created a new philosophy. So from the workers experience with automation comes a new humanism. The beginning of the end of state capitalism has of necessity begun behind the iron curtain. Men everywhere breathed freer when those under Russian totalitarian domination answered affirmatively the question that seems to preoccupy the contemporary world. Can man wrest freedom from the stranglehold of the one-party state? The fundamental problem of true freedom, however, remains. What type of labor can end the division between thinkers and doers? This is the innermost core of Marxism. The transformation of totalitarian society on totally new beginnings can have no other foundation than a new material life, a new kind of labor for the producer, the worker. This basic question was posed first, not behind the Iron Curtain, but on this side of it. It arose out of the new stage of production called automation. It was posed first by the miners who, with the introduction of the continuous miner, began to question not only the fruits of labor wages, but the kind of labor. As one young worker put it when he was told that the union would not fight for a shorter work week, the four day week wouldn't make much difference. Oh, that the union would now fight for a shorter work week. The four day week wouldn't make much difference. We are liable, liable to wind up working the same hours as now and get overtime pay for all work over 35 hours. What has to be different is the way we have to work. Coming in every day and working under company discipline, afraid to stay out, is no way. Russia can't be much different. If you think about it, the only reason this way of life seems to make sense is that this is the way people are used to living. Work that would be completely tied up with life, and doing that would not be separated from thinking, a new unity of theory and practice unified in the worker himself, or in the full tradition of Marx's concept of work as human activity that develops all of man's natural and acquired talents. Thus, the workers, the American workers, made concrete and thereby extended Marx's most abstract theories of alienated labor and the quest for universality. Marx was right when he said the workers were the true inheritors of Hegelian philosophy. In truth, while the intellectual void today is so great that the movement from theory to practice has nearly come to a standstill. The movement from practice to theory, and with it, a new unity of manual and mental labor in the worker are in evidence everywhere. Three, toward a new unity of theory and practice in the abolitionist and Marxist tradition. The American working class has long been a mystery to the European worker and intellectual. Until the formation of the CIO, Europeans used to prove the backwardness of the American worker 
by virtue of the fact that he had not built industrial union unions. Europeans cannot understand how it is that the American working class, the muddiest in the world, has not built a labor party of its own, as has the European working class, and how it is that no Marxist party has ever taken deep root here. Because the American worker has built no mass party, he seems apolitical. Because he is largely unacquainted with the doctrines of Karl Marx, he seems non-socialist. They admit he is very militant, but there they stop. To his own thoughts, they do not listen, because, being uninhibited by European tradition, he has different ways of expressing them. The truth is that the, is that the most politically advanced workers in the world, the French, thought of nothing better than what the American workers did, sitting down. Only in Spain did the outburst take the form of an outright revolution. They began immediately with taking control of the factories. Thus, throughout the world, the workers were attempting to reorganize society by beginning with the reorganization of production relations in the factory. They did not, they did not succeed, but they tried and discovered some new truths in, in so doing the intellectuals just stuck to the old categories, unable to move forward either in theory or in practice. The cynic stands ready to show that despite all the hope and efforts of the 1930s, the workers did not complete a revolution, did not create a worker state, did not build a new society. He concludes, therefore, that all the movements, including the national resistance movements during the war, the wartime wildcats and Negro demonstrations, the post-war strikes, the current colonial revolts, have been, if not for, th for not, certainly unsuccessful. That is true. The deeper truth, however, is that the workers did something, the full consequences of which we do not yet know. Certainly no fundamental problems have been solved by World War II. The crisis is now total. The H-bomb puts a question mark over the very survival of civilization as we have known it. While the workers acted and showed they had a mind of their own, the intellectuals parroted empty phrases and ignored the workers. There has never been a greater theoretical void in the Marxist movement or out of it. When the 1929 crash occurred, production came nearly to a standstill. Millions of workers were thrown into the streets. Now that everyone saw that production is primary, the class lines became not weaker, but stronger. The New Deal is proof enough that the capitalist class too had suffered a serious split. Every serious tension between the working class and the capitalist class produces a rift in the camp of the ruling class itself, but that, but that is not irreparable. To run production in capitalist society, the capitalists sit upon the direct producers. Where there is a crisis, those bureaucrats do not get off the workers' backs. They sit the harder. The New Deal did not tamper with that relationship at the point of production. Neither did the, did the intellectual planners who came out of Harvard and Columbia, Yale and Princeton, Antioch and the College of the City of New York, Stanford University or the University of Chicago etc. Just as there are only two fundamental classes in society, the working class and the capitalist class, so there are only two fundamental ways of thinking. The 1929 crash which shook the world to the foundations cut sharply across the American mind, splitting it into two opposing parts. One, the brain trust or intellectual planners, small and large, those who invented the New Deal to save capitalism and those who wanted to use the New Deal to move headlong to total planning according to the Russian model were not so totally different from each other that they did not find intellectual cohabitation pleasant. Both had one cure for all the ills in the world. It was plan. Two, on the other hand, the rank and file workers tried to reorganize production on entirely new foundations by demanding that those who labor should control production. They too had but one word to describe how to do it. It was sit down. The very spontaneity of the action created the CIO. What had been a top committee within the AF of L 
overnight became a congress of the greatest mass concentration of industrial workers. While the workers were creating organizations of their own, characteristically American and specifically working class, the American intellectual was rudderless, drifting into the communist created popular front. The Russian communists had a field day, penetrating everywhere from the newspaper guild to the state department, from the labor bureaucracy in Detroit to filmdom in Hollywood. The American intellectual was not an unwilling victim. He zealously tried to influence the American worker. If he failed, it was not his fault. The American intellectual has one trait in common with all intellectuals. He looks down upon the native working class as backward. But while the Communist Party of the United States took over the American intellectual bodily, emotionally and financially, it remained without serious roots among the American working class. The intellectuals have left the Communist Party and its many fronts since then, not always for the most principled reasons but they expose themselves currently as still rudderless on the one question where American politics has always been expressed in its sharpest form, the Negro question. 1956 opened a new stage in the black struggle for freedom. The fight down South was proceeding along two fronts, one, school integration, and two, the bus boy boycotts. Immedi immediately, the cultured South asked for understanding Life magazine, so busy selling the American way of life abroad, responded by leading the battle of the northern magazines to sell the southern way of life. The novelist, William Falk Faulkner, struck the first and most telling blow by announcing that he would be willing to spill black blood to maintain the southern way of life. Oh, that's not good. Oppression has ever worn a white face down south. And now, so does the denigration of its culture. Where in this are the intellectuals, North or South, who oppose this cultured blood brother of Senator Eastland, the Nobel Prize winner, William Faulkner? No doubt there are many. Where they do not keep quiet, however, they write for little journal journals read by radicals who need no convincing. Despite the shabby role of the American communists on the Negro question, these intellectuals are ready to be sucked into another popular front. Yet it is not for want of American tradition. One of the most glorious pages in American history was written by the white intellectual, precisely on the Negro question, in that very critical period preceding the Civil War. The abolitionists arose in America and out of America, out of its genius with no assistance from any foreign tradition. At the same time, the masthead of William Lloyd Garrison's Liberator read, The world is my country. The abolitionists added a dimension to the very concept of intellectual by consciously choosing to be the means by which a social movement, the movement of the slaves for freedom, expressed itself. The intellectuals of today are busy telling us how the communists pervert history, which is true enough. But wherein is the difference between Russians leaving out the role of Trotsky in the 1917 revolution and the American textbooks, which do not even mention Wendell Phillips? Where Faulkner today does a lot of double talking about being morally against segregation, but being non-hesitant to spill the blood to preserve the alleged underdog, the Southern way of life. Here's what Phillips had to say of the Southern way of life. And by the South, I mean likewise a principle, and not a locality, an element of civil life, in 14 rebellious states. I mean an element which, like the days of Queen Mary and the Inquisition, cannot tolerate free speech, and punishes it with the stake. I mean the aristocracy of the skin, which considers the Declaration of Independence a sham, and democracy a snare, which believes that one third of the race is born booted and spurred, and the other two-thirds ready saddled for that third to ride. I mean a civilization which prohibits the Bible by statute to every sixth man of its community, and puts a matron in a felon's cell for teaching a black sister to read. I mean the intellectual, social arist aristocratic South, the thing that manifests itself by barbarism and the bowie knife, by bullying and lynch law, by ignorance and idleness, 
by the claim of one man to own his brother, by statutes making it penal for the state of Massachusetts to bring an action in her courts, by statutes standing on the books of Georgia today, offering $5,000 for the head of William Lloyd Garrison. That South is to be annihilated. The totality of my common sense, or whatever you may call it, is this, all summed up in one word. This country will never know peace nor union until the South, using the word in the sense I have described, is annihilated and the North is spread over it. Our struggle, therefore, is between barbarism and civilization. The struggle for the minds of men today cannot be won by hollow slogans for democracy. The Europeans have seen too much of life since 1914. They aren't buying the voice of America, cult American culture. And for good reason. They know the black person not only his great contributions to American culture, from jazz to historical writing. They know what he is doing presently. There is the forceful voice of the Alabama Alabama Negroes who have taken the matter of their freedom into their own hands and have never let go in all these months. Because the spontaneity of the walkout and the organization of their forces to keep up the boycott was a simultaneous action, it is here that we can see what is truly historic and contains our future. Just watch how they have never let anything slip out of their hands during the boycott. They have been, or one, they have been in continuous session. Daily, there are small meetings, three times weekly, mass meetings, at all times, the new relationships. Two, the, de the decision is always their own. When the state Supreme Court handed down its de decision against segregated buses and the bus company, hungry for their profits, hung up notices, they would obey decisions. The black people said, we also asked for black bus drivers to the city fathers who proclaimed segregation as the Southern way of life. They, as Southerners, said that if they never ride the buses, it will be soon enough. Three, the organization, organization of their own transportation without either boss or political supervision is a model. Clearly the greatest thing of all in this Montgomery, Alabama, spontaneous organization was its own working existence. When Faulkner is the man whom Eisenhower asks to form a new organization of intellectuals to tell Europeans about American democracy and the other American intellectuals bear this silently, Europeans know that courage does not come out of thin air, but out of conviction that you are part of and represent the wave of the future. As the black struggle for freedom does, does and the Southern way of life does not. Under such circumstances, the American intellectual struggle to win the mind of man can only be presumptuous. Thus, in society as a whole, as in production, the crisis is total. Our point of departure has always been production only because to see the crisis in, in production means to understand it everywhere else. Failure to see it in production means inability to understand the crisis anywhere. This does not mean that the crisis of our age is limited to production. Our age has rightly been characterized as the crisis of the mind. It is precisely the totality of the crisis that compels philosophy, a total outlook. But the American intellectual has failed signally to grasp such a total outlook. He is a man divided a dozen ways and is furthest removed from reality. It is not Marxists who have compelled society at last to face with sober senses the conditions of labor and the relations of men with each other. Our life and times have compelled that confrontation. In everyday life on the practical questions of the day and in every layer of society, the great philosophic battles that matter are precisely those over production, the role of the working class, the one party state, H bomb, or to put it more simply, the critical questions are, how are workers to be made to produce more? And will civilization as we know it survive at all? Where the intellectual combatants, as in America, are not professed dialecticians, as many in Europe and Asia are, they are worsted in the bargain. The seal of bankruptcy of contemporary civilization, including the so-called vanguard parties, 
is the bankruptcy of its thought. The void in the Marxist movement since Lenin's death would have a significance only for Marxists, except that Marxism is in the daily lives and aspirations of working people. Marxism is neither in the pathetic little theses gathering dust in small radical organizations, nor in impressively big tomes gathering dust on the shelves of large conservative universities. The main difficulty in seeing the elements of the new society in the present is that workers repeat many of the ideas of the, of the ruling class until the very day that an explosive break actually occurs. Take the tremendous movement which created the CIO. Who would have thought in 1935 when John L. Lewis proposed to William Green the formation of some industrial unions that the unskilled workers would break out in the gigantic sit-down strikes that challenged private property? Nobody, absolutely nobody, not even the workers themselves knew the world-shaking passions and forces that lay behind their restlessness and bitterness and that oh hold on and that they would express themselves simply in sitting down when the reporters came to ask lewis whether he had ordered the sit down it was obvious that the very word let alone the action was as strange to him as to the reporters it was obvious he had not thought of it, far less ordered it. Although he knew enough of leadership to be for it. He was taken by surprise, not because he was merely a trade union leader whose head was full of bourgeois ideas. No, not even the founder of Marxism who stood for a new society and predicted its inevitable coming when all others saw only the solidity of the old, the status quo, did not and could not have foreseen the spontaneous action of the French working class in storming the heavens and creating the Paris Commune. No single human being, nor even the Bolshevik party of Lenin, could have predicted, far less organized, the Soviet. No one could have guessed it was coming until it came. But isn't it obvious now that the Russian workers, in their own way and among themselves, were coming to the conclusion that they wanted something other than parliamentary democracy? They thought so... They thought so as far back as 1905 when they created the St. Petersburg Soviet. No one told them to. No one organized it. No one made a new category out of it when it did arise. The only ones who remembered the 1905 Soviet and held fast to that division and that act were the Russian workers. They recreated them in 1917, this time on a national scale. The first day that happened, Lenin, as we saw, was still repeating that it was necessary to combine legal and illegal work, when, in actuality, the masses had already created open, mass, tremendous organizations. The next day, he finally saw. When he did, he didn't say, I always thought so, haven't I said, etc., etc. No, he recognized the new in fact and in theory, and reorganized all, all without exception, all of his old categories, from the democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and peasantry to the vanguard nature of the party and its leadership. Now, he said, the Russian reality has shown that the rank and file of the party were 10 times more revolutionary than the leadership and the great masses outside the party 10 times more revolutionary than the party. If in 1970, if in 1917, it was clear that the Russian workers moved beyond parliamentary democracy. It should have been clear in 1936-37 to 37 that the American workers had moved from the question of who owned the property to the question of who co controlled production. The workers didn't start any arguments about private property. They merely sat down at the machines they had always operated and said they would not leave until the conditions of labor were changed. Only after the first great outburst do the masses begin to bring their energies and their years of thought to bear upon the problems that face them. Then, day by day and minute by minute, their own class ideas and class program rapidly unfold. This has once again grown as big as life and as final as death in the Hungarian Revolution, which was begun by the whole population, including intellectuals. But as it developed, the whole brunt shifted to the workers' councils, that is, to the workers in the factories. Their action once again made obvious that the workers had a mind of their own long before the outbreak, and which was sustained long after the, the defeat. 
As in 1917, the Russian workers alone remembered the Soviet of 1905. So this time, not alone the Hungarian, but the world working class would remember the Hungarian workers' councils. The working class has not created a new society, but the workers have undermined the old. They have destroyed all the old categories. They have no belief in the rationality either of the economic or of the political order. The vanguard, on the other hand, has done nothing. It is stuck in the mud of the old fixed categories, chief of which is the party to lead. In the face of the movement from practice to theory during the 1930s and again during the 1940s, and especially during the present period of automation, the Trotskyists and other radical parties continue to repeat the outlived thesis of the vanguard party, Lenin espoused back in 1902-03. This makes their intellectual abdication as complete as if they had never broken from the communist parties. It is equally true of those unaffiliated Marxists who, being incapable of breaking out of the old categories, let alone creating new ones, are compelled to return to Bukharin's attitude of blaming the workers for the betrayal of the Second International. When Lenin accused Bukharin of ha having allowed the imperialist war to suppress his thinking, he accurately analyzed these present-day Marxist intellectuals who would rather blame the workers as a class than face the challenge to reorganize their thinking that is being hurled at them by new humanist impulses from ever deeper strata of the workers. Affiliated or unaffiliated, the party to lead has them all by the throat. <coughs> it goes without saying that the past masters at that are the communists. The capitalist mentality of all these planners is shown nowhere as clearly as on the question of automation. No. No private property capitalist has ever dreamed more fantastic dreams of push-button factories without workers than the present rulers of Russia. Um, the totalitarian bureaucracy hopes through automation to overcome the Russian resistance to the plans. At the same time, these bureaucrats think they have it all over the capitalist world because they can repeat Marxist phrases about the end of the separation between mental and manual labor. Some sound exactly like Ruther and his every worker an engineer. On the eve of the Geneva Congress in 1955, the official papers Pravda and Izvestia were filled with articles on what is holding back automation. Then they held an all-union conference of industrial personnel and issued an appeal to all workers, engineers, technicians, and employees in the Soviet Union to learn from the experience of the production innovators. The Russian worker took it to mean more speed up and continued his resistance. The following year, the 20th Congress of the Russian Communist Party, which so loudly proclaimed de-Stalinization, continued the Stalinist line of production and more production with the following new twist. Bulganin said, great harm is caused to technical progress in our country, but underestimating the achievements of technology abroad. The main thing is not to discover first, but to introduce first. Industry must be redesigned to provide proper incentive to technical innovation. The redesigning turned out to be the application of automation in such a way as to teach the workers respect for the intellectuals who are the production innovators. The Russian workers are no different than the American workers. They too want to know what happens after. Where the workers begin with questions, what happens after the conquest of power? Are we always to be confronted with a new labor bureaucracy which is to end in the one party state? The vanguard has nothing to say, but first do this and follow me. The capitalist ideologist is as good at giving commands Look at the new wonders of automation and follow me. Everyone is ready to lead, no one to listen. Intellectual sloth just accumulates and accumulates to the point where the self-complacent scientific individual is permitted to write with impunity and unthinkingly of man viewed as machine. Evidently, no human passion nowadays is beyond a mathematical formula that can forthwith be made practicable in a buildable machine. 
What they all forget is that a new society is the human endeavor, or it is nothing. It cannot be brought in behind the backs of the people, neither by the vanguard nor by the scientific individuals. The working people will build it, or it will not be built. There is a crying need for a new unity of theory and practice, which begins with where the working people are, their thoughts, their struggles, their aspirations. This is not intellectual abdication. Intellectual abdication took place during the Long Depression because intellectuals had no philosophy or method of thought and just drifted into the camp of the fellow travelers or outright followers of the party line. Intellectual abdication reappeared when McCarthyism so panicked them that they willingly and without the duress of Moscow trials participated in public confessionals. Intellectual abdication reigns supreme when scientific men are allowed to take command of the field of thought as if that too were a buildable machine. Intellectual growth will first begin when new ground is broken. The elements of the new society present in the old or present in the old are everywhere in evidence in the thoughts and lives of the working class. Where the workers think their own thoughts, there must be the intellectual to absorb the new impulses. Outside of that, there can be no serious theory. Philosophy springs from, from the empirical sciences and actual life. But incorporation of these laws and generalizations into philosophy, Hegel showed, implies a compulsion of thought itself to proceed to these concrete truths. Hegel knew whereof he spoke when he told the intellectuals of his day that the sense of bondage springs from inability to surmount the antithesis and from looking at what is and what happens as contradictory to what ought to be and happen. The modern intellectuals will lose their sense of guilt and bondage when they will react to the compulsion of thought to proceed to these concrete truths. The actions of the black school children in Little Rock, Arkansas, to break down segregation, the wildcats in Detroit for a different kind of labor than the under present day automation, the struggles the world over for freedom. The alignment precisely with such struggles in the days of the abolitionists and of Marx is what gave these intellectuals that extra dimension as theoreticians and as human beings, which enabled them to become part of the new society. It will do so again. Once the intellectual accepts the challenge of the times, then the ideal and the real are seen to be not far apart. The worker is right when he demands that work be completely different and not separated from life itself, and that thinking and doing be united. Once the theoretician has caught this, just this, impulse from the worker, his work does not end. It first then begins. A new unity of theory and practice can evolve only when the movement from theory to practice meets the movement from practice to theory. The totality of the world crisis has a new form fear at the beep beep from the new man-made moon. The American rush to catch up with the Sputnik, like the Russian determination to be the first to launch the satellite, is not in the interest of pure science, but for the purpose of total war. Launching satellites into outer space cannot solve the problems of this earth. The challenge of our times is not to machines, but to men. Intercontinental missiles can destroy mankind. They cannot solve its human relations. The creation of a new society remains the human endeavor. The totality of the crisis demands and will create a total solution. It can be nothing short of a new humanism.